Hi, I have a confession to make. I absolutely love complex numbers. They are one of the most amazing ideas in all of mathematics. What I despise is mystique and darkness surrounding them. Look at these silly jokes. Non-math people think that mathematicians are crazy and jokes like these only reinforce that. It makes me sad since mathematics is full of the most amazing ideas. Unfortunately, they remain hidden. Jokes aside, Veritasio made this video about complex numbers. While it beautifully explains the history, it also contains some weird statements like this one. Only by abandoning math's connection to reality could we discover reality's true nature. What a nonsense! I will show you that complex numbers are completely natural. Moreover, this is known for over 200 years. The point here is not to trash Derek's work, as I am a huge fan of Veritasium. It just highlights the amount of confusion and darkness surrounding complex numbers. We waste so much potential of countless people by teaching complex numbers as these mysterious imaginary entities. This has to stop. The goal of this video is to demystify complex numbers. I will fully explain that they describe geometric transformations of the plane. And we will show that the only source of confusion about square roots of negative numbers is our bad terminology and notation. We start with a little bit of historical context. In high school, I was told that complex numbers were invented to add solutions to the quadratic formula when real ones do not exist. This doesn't make any sense since the well-known graph of parabola does not intersect the x-axis. So there are no solutions. Complex numbers were actually discovered while studying cubic polynomials which always intersect the x-axis. The general solution of the cubic equation was first described by Cardano in 1545 in his book Artis Magna. In one formula, square roots of negative numbers were encountered. But they did cancel out in the end and produce a correct real solution. Cardano himself commented this case by saying, as subtle, as it is useless. But it caught the attention of Bombelli. In his two books on algebra, he performed the first substantial calculations with complex numbers. He called the square root of minus 1, nowadays denoted i, as the plus of minus. This is everything I want to say about these equations. If you want to know more, I recommend the excellent history description in the Veritasium video. There is also a discussion with Fribu van Braun, which explains mathematics behind cubic and quartic formulas. And these two videos by Mathemaniac and Not All Wrong show why there is no quintic formula. If you want to explore all these extra materials, don't worry. This presentation is built in the online application Orkpad, of which I am one of the creators. You can find a link to this presentation in the video description. Let's go back to complex numbers. Even after a hundred years, they were still viewed with suspicion and disbelief. Descartes associated imaginary numbers with geometric impossibility. He coined the term imaginary, basically stating that one can invent solutions of an equation, but it does not mean that these imaginary quantities have any real meaning. Even the magician Euler called complex numbers impossible, while proving many substantial results. He also introduced the notation i for the square root of minus 1. Shortly after, Wessel and Argan first described geometry of complex numbers, but their work was not widely known. Only when the prominent mathematician Gauss described this geometry in 1831, people took notice. While working on this video, I discovered a great quote by Gauss that accurately reflects my approach to explaining complex numbers. 
if this subject has hitherto been considered from the wrong viewpoint, and thus enveloped in mystery and surrounded by darkness, it is largely an unsuitable terminology which should be blamed. At plus one, minus one, and square root of minus one, instead of being called positive, negative, and imaginary, or worse still impossible unity, been given the name, say, of direct, inverse, and lateral unity, there would hardly have been any scope for such obscurity. Wow, I love this so much. Mathematicians notice Gauss's work, fix their misunderstandings, and all mystery of complex numbers is gone. Sadly, that's not the case. The amount of mystique and darkness has only grown. Traveling back in time to Descartes and Euler, it makes sense that imaginary numbers raised eyebrows and doubts. But thanks to Gauss's brilliant insights, we can no longer use ignorance as an excuse. Yet, even after 200 years, the Gauss's work is still misunderstood, and he is furious about that. Let's fix it in this video. With the great power of the internet, you can help by watching, liking, and adding some comments, so we can together be the almighty YouTube algorithm. Please, share this video with your family and friends, educate your grandma, and explain it even to your dog. Let's sidestep the complex numbers for a second and talk about plane geometry. If you are familiar with vectors, matrices, and their geometric meaning, feel free to skip to the next chapter. All points of the plane, also called vectors, can be described as pairs of numbers representing the coordinates on the x and y axis. Vectors can be added by summing their coordinates, corresponding to adding forces in physics. And vectors can be scaled by an arbitrary number alpha, making the resulting vector longer or shorter. If alpha is negative, the direction of the vector is flipped. We can apply geometric transformations of the plane. You are probably familiar with these from computer graphic editors. The entire plane can be scaled by some factor, which scales all the vectors. We can also rotate all the vectors around the origin by some angle, and the plane can be reflected along some line, x-axis in this example. All these transformations have one thing in common. Their pictures display two vectors u and v, and their sum u plus v. Notice that it doesn't matter whether we first add them and then transform the result, or whether we add u and v already transformed. In both situations, we get the same result. In other words, this equality is always satisfied. Transformations of the plane, which satisfy this equality, and also a similar equality for scaling, are called linear. All previously shown transformations are linear. By using alpha equals zero, it easily follows that every linear transformation preserves the origin. So a notable nonlinear transformation is the translation of the plane by some vector, which means adding this vector to all vectors in the plane. Suppose that we have some linear transformation f. What is the least amount of information we need to know to fully describe it. It turns out that not that much is needed. Notice that any vector xy can be expressed as the sum of x times 1 0 with y times 0 1. By linearity, it follows that the image of xy is fully determined by the images of 1 0 and 0 1. We know that the image of 1 0 is some vector AB and the image of 0, 1 is some other vector CD. In total, F is fully described by four numbers A, B, C, D, which are placed in a 2x2 two two table. The first column represents the image of 1, 0, while the second column represents the image of 0, 1. 
This table is called a matrix. Let's see some examples which will be important later when we describe geometry of complex numbers. When every vector of the plane is scaled by some factor r, the vector 1 0 is mapped to r 0 and 0 1 is mapped to 0 r. So the resulting matrix is the diagonal matrix with r on the diagonal. For the 90 degree rotation, the vector 1 0 is mapped to the other vector 0 1, while 0 1 is mapped to minus 1 0. So the resulting matrix has 0 on the diagonal and plus 1 and minus 1 of the diagonal. The matrix of an arbitrary rotation is a little bit more involved. From geometry, 1 0 is rotated to the coordinates cosine phi and sine phi, which are the coordinates of the point on the unit circle with the angle phi. The other vector, 0, 1, is rotated by further 90 degrees to the point which after some simplifications has the coordinates minus sine phi and cosine phi. So the resulting matrix has cosine phi on the diagonal and sine phi and minus sine phi off the diagonal. Ok, we know that each linear transformation is represented by some 2x2 two two matrix. So what? How is this information useful? It would be great to use this matrix to describe the image of an input vector xy. Recall that the image of xy is a combination of the images of 1 0 and 0 1 which are described by the columns of the matrix. So we can just scale the first column by x and scale the second one by y and sum them together. This is precisely how matrix vector multiplication works. So to find the image of xy, we just need to multiply it by the matrix. Let's apply this knowledge on the 90 degree rotation. We already know the rotation matrix, so by multiplying xy with it, we get the vector minus y x. This is a neat trick I already discovered at high school. To rotate a plane vector by 90 degrees, we just need to swap the coordinates and switch the sign of one of them. This nicely explains the matrix of an arbitrary rotation. The image of the blue vector is obtained by rotating the image of the red vector by 90 degrees. The coordinates of cosine phi sine phi are swapped and the sign of sine phi is switched. Linear transformations can be chained. We first map the plane by a linear transformation f and then map the images by another linear transformation g. The resulting composite transformation is again linear. It turns out that it is represented by the matrix multiplication b times a. For example, when we apply the 90 degree rotation twice, it becomes the 180 degree rotation. We already know the matrix A of the 90 degree rotation. The matrix of the 180 degree rotation is obtained by multiplying A with A, which is A squared. Since the 180 degree rotation flips each vector, it is correctly represented by the matrix A squared. In summary, we have seen that points of the plane are represented by two coordinate vectors, while their transformations are described with 2 by 2 matrices. Whenever you see a matrix, geometrically it corresponds to some linear transformation. I believe the concept of linear transformations and their matrix representation is the single most important idea in all of mathematics. For instance, the derivative of a function satisfies these equalities, so it is a linear transformation. If you want to learn more about linear transformations, I recommend this excellent book by Gilbert Strang. You can also check out a free Boo Van Brown video that uses animation to explain linear transformations. I taught linear algebra for several years and have written a few books in Czech about it. Needless to say, it is one of my favorite topics in mathematics. 
With the built geometric understanding, we are finally ready to tackle complex numbers. They actually have two different geometric meanings. The first meaning states that the complex number a plus bi corresponds to the vector ab. The fact that all complex numbers form the two-dimensional plane is well known and it is often called Gauss complex plane. There is some evidence that this was already known to Euler. The other geometric meaning is much less known. The complex number a plus bi corresponds to the 2 by 2 matrix with a on the diagonal and b and minus b off the diagonal. At this moment, it is not clear why one should place a and b into a matrix like this, so consider it a lucky guess. We will show that it reveals geometry of complex numbers hidden for centuries. To see that these representations are valid, we have to prove that addition and multiplication works for them in the same way as for a plus bi. Complex numbers are added by independently summing their real and imaginary parts. Similarly, vectors and matrices are added by independently summing their coordinates. So we get the same complex number having the real part a plus c and the imaginary part b plus d. Complex numbers are multiplied by multiplying the parentheses where i squared is equal minus 1. By grouping the real and imaginary parts together, we get the real part ac minus bd and the imaginary part ad plus bc. Vectors don't have a standard way to multiply them, but we can easily define it in the same way. Multiplying the matrices representing a plus bi and c plus di gives ac minus bd on the diagonal and ad plus bc and minus ad minus bc off the diagonal. So the resulting 2 by 2 matrix represents the same complex number. Ok, now we know that these representations are valid. Each complex number a plus bi corresponds to the matrix with a on the diagonal and b and minus b off the diagonal. This matrix represents a geometric transformation. Which one? We know the drill. The columns of this matrix describe the images of the vectors 10 and 01. So 10 is mapped to some vector ab, while 01 is mapped to minus ba. We also know that minus ba is the 90 degree rotation of ab. Since both 10 and 01 are scaled by the common factor r equal the length of ab, one part of the transformation is scaling the plane. Both 10 and 01 are also rotated by the angle phi, which is the angle of ab. Therefore, the complex number a plus bi is the geometric transformation, which is the composition of scaling the plane by the length of ab and rotating the plane by the angle of ab. Scaling can be called amplification and rotation twists the plane. Tristam Needham, in his excellent book Visual Complex Analysis, coined the beautiful term amplitwist to describe the geometric effect of complex multiplication. Do you recall trigonometric form? Many people when seeing this lose all hope to ever understand complex numbers. But it is not that complicated. When reformulated to matrices, it states that the matrix on the left with A and B is equal to the matrix on the right containing sines and cosines. Our geometric argument already proves that these matrices are the same. Complex numbers form a very efficient language to describe geometric transformations of the plane and not just by multiplication. Addition of a fixed complex number W to the plane corresponds to the translation of the plane 
by this vector w. As we already know, translation is not a linear transformation. Multiplication by a fixed complex number w is the amplitude twist of the plane, which consists of scaling the plane by the length of w and rotating it by the angle of w. In this language, we can describe geometric transformations of a few basic complex values as follows. Zero, represented by the zero matrix, collapses the entire plane into the origin. One, represented by the identity matrix, is the identity transformation preserving the entire plane. I, represented by the matrix having one and minus one of the diagonal, is the 90 degree rotation. Minus one, represented by the matrix having minus one on the diagonal, is the 180 degree rotation. And finally minus i, represented by the matrix having minus one and one off the diagonal, is the 270 degree rotation of the plane, or the 90 degree rotation in the opposite direction. So whenever one sees i in some equation, it can be understood as the 90 degree rotation in some geometry. There is nothing mysterious or imaginary about that. Even the standard complex notation a plus bi can be understood as going a in the real axis direction and then going b in this direction rotated by 90 degrees, which is the imaginary axis direction. But the geometry of complex numbers does not end here. The complex conjugation switches the sign of the imaginary part, so a plus bi is mapped to a minus bi. Geometrically, it is the reflection of the plane along the x-axis. In the language of matrices, it corresponds to the matrix transpose AT. Similarly, the division by a complex number can be explained geometrically. More generally, there is a beautiful family of Mabius transformations which map Z to AZ plus B divided by CZ plus D, where ABCD are some fixed complex numbers. The excellent video below explores geometry of these transformations. Also chapter 3 of Visual Complex Analysis deals with this topic in detail. In summary, we have explained two different geometric meanings of complex numbers. They are points of the plane and they are geometric transformations of the plane, represented with 2 by 2 matrices. They are not numbers, similarly as we do not call matrices as matrix numbers. Complex numbers form a very efficient language to describe geometric transformations of the plane and beyond. It is no wonder that they have found vast applications in all areas of mathematics, physics and computer science. Geometry is everywhere and efficient descriptions of it are very useful. To explain geometry of the square root, let's first discuss the square operation. In the context of real numbers, we get a square with the side x, whose area is x squared. This is the reason why the square operation is called square. Alternatively, we have the well-known graph of the parabola. For a given value x, its value f of x is equal x squared. On the other hand, a complex number is an amplitude transformation, so it is some scaling by r and some rotation by phi. Squaring this transformation means that it is applied twice. When we scale twice by r, the total scaling effect is r squared. And rotating twice by phi is the same as rotating once by 2 phi. So z squared is the amplitude transformation scaling by r squared and rotating by 2 phi. For example, when z is the 90 degree rotation, we have already shown that z squared is the 180 degree rotation. 
We get better geometric insight by squaring the entire plane. Suppose that we smoothly morph the plane by moving each point towards its square. This motion winds the plane twice around the origin since all angles are doubled. For instance, the points of the spiral on the left go once around the origin while their images go twice around. We can understand this motion better by viewing it in three dimensions. The complex plane is placed at the bottom and the images of the square transformation are displayed by the colorful spiral. We start at the bottom and as we rotate around, the images are placed higher and higher. Notice that the images form two layers on top of every point of the plane with exception of the origin. A point Z is squared to the same point as its 180 degree rotation which is equal to minus Z. This 3D representation of Z squared is closely related to the concept of Riemann surfaces. See this beautiful video for more visualizations. As Gauss states, the origin of all this confusion is bad mathematical terminology and notation. When using the same symbols for concepts of different meaning, it naturally leads to misunderstandings and ideas are wrongly mixed. As a freshman at university, I recall my calculus professor describing complex analysis as being exactly the same as real analysis for a while, but then one gets all these wild surprising consequences. It didn't make much sense to him since the same notation was used for ideas of completely different meaning. So what about the square root? We start with the definition. The square root is the inverse of the square operation. Therefore, the square root of z is defined as a value w such that w squared is equal to z. In case of real geometry, we have a square of known area z. We ask what is the length of the side of this square. Since there is no square with negative area, the square root of a negative number is meaningless. From complex geometry, we know that each complex number z is a geometric transformation. Its square root is therefore another transformation w which becomes z when it is applied twice. We just need to find it using geometry of complex numbers. Let's take a look at a simple example. We already know that minus 1 is the 180 degree rotation of the plane. So we ask which amplitude transformation has to be applied twice to get this rotation. Since minus 1 does not scale the plane, the unknown square root does not scale the plane as well. It is easy to see that applying either the 90 degree rotation or the minus 90 degree rotation twice results into the 180 degree rotation. So the square root of minus 1 is either i or minus i. There is nothing magical or imaginary about that. To understand the square root of an arbitrary complex number z, recall that it is some amplitude transformation scaling the plane by r and rotating it by phi. We want to find another amplitude transformation which becomes z when applied twice. Concerning scaling, this transformation has to be scaled by the square root of r. When the angle is half of phi, it becomes phi when applied twice. So the amplitude is scaling the plane by the square root of r and rotating it by half of phi is a valid square root. But there is another one. w is the square root of z when w squared is equal z. The opposite point minus w is also squared to z. It does the same scaling by the square root of r. The angle of minus w has extra 180 degrees compared to w. When minus w is applied twice, we get an additional rotation by 360 degrees, which is the full circle. So the resulting amplitude minus w squared 
has the same angle as W squared. We have already observed this behavior when we analyze the effect of the square transformation in 3D. Each point of the plane is covered by two layers of the image. Suppose that we pierce the spiral from top at some point P for which we want to know the square root. If we undo the square motion, the spiral unwinds back into the plane. It is pierced in two different points opposite to each other. These two points are the square roots of P. In summary, we have seen that both the square and the square root transformations have different meanings for real and complex numbers. In the real case, they describe the relation between the length of a side of a square and its area. In the complex case, geometric transformations are studied. Squaring means that we apply some transformation twice. For the square root of a transformation, we ask which another transformation has to be applied twice to get this original transformation. All confusion originates from bad mathematical notation, such as the square root of minus one. There is nothing magical or imaginary about complex numbers. It is just simple geometry. I want to conclude this video with a personal story. During my studies at Charles University in Prague, I was very lucky to meet Zdeněk Hedruin. He was a stellar Czech mathematician who studied algebra, category theory and graph theory. Later in his life, he applied mathematics in various fields such as sociology, psychology, biology and medicine. Professor Hedrin spent tremendous amount of time discussing with me everything from mathematics to philosophy. He became de facto my unofficial PhD supervisor and completely changed my life. I still remember his beautiful description of complex analysis as the study of sinks and vortexes, which took me several years to unpack. Each complex function defines a certain flow in the plane. Access, in the real value at some point, represented by the complex potential, creates a source. Imaginary complex potential creates a vortex, and we already know that it is geometrically a rotation. In general, some combination of these might happen. See this interactive complex analysis book. Zdeněk Hedruin has another connection to this video. He spent the last 40 years of his life studying brain, how to model it with mathematics and how to use computers to better understand it. He died in spring 2018 and shortly before I promised to him that I will turn his idea into a tool which can help a lot of people. With my friends, we have spent the last five years realizing Hedrin's vision by building this application called OrcPad. I want to illustrate the strength of OrcPad on one concrete example. My wife and I have played the computer game Zero's Escape, Virtue's Last Reward. This game consists of many logic and math puzzles. In particular, the dice puzzle caught my attention. In it, one reconfigures several dice by rolling them. The goal is to place them in the center while showing the prescribed numbers on top. As a mathematician, I got interested in the following simplified problem. Suppose that we have just a single dice. We want to roll it a few times and finish in the same starting position. The dice may end up with a different rotation than when it started. The question is, what are all the possible rotations of the dice I can obtain in this manner? From my research, I knew that group theory is the right tool to attack this problem, but details were not clear to me. So I sat down in front of OrcPad for about two hours and built my understanding of this problem. There are 24 rotational symmetries of the dice forming a group. To see its structure, I have built a Cayley graph. Its vertices are these 24 rotational symmetries. 
red arrows rotate the dice to the right, while blue arrows rotate the dice forward. This graph reveals the beautiful symmetrical structure hidden within the group. To end up in the same place, necessarily an even number of rotations has to be applied. Therefore, starting in a pink vertex means that we have to end up in another pink vertex, so only 12 of these rotations can theoretically be reached. While playing the game, I was able to generate many rotations by cycling the dice. Moving it, say left, forward, right, backwards. But how many? And what if we introduce some other sequence of four moves, say rotating the dice right, forward, left, backwards? I analyze this situation in OrgPad. When we apply a single of these four move sequences repeatedly, we cycle through three different rotations of the dice. But when we apply both of them, all 12 possible rotations can be reached. The structure is again depicted by a Cayley graph. If you are interested in more details, let me know in the comments. I can make a longer video about this problem and group theory. This is a general way to build understanding and OrgPad is a great tool for that. Just throw your unclear ideas there, play with them and you can immediately benefit from better understanding. Moreover, since OrgPad is based on Hedrin's 40 years long research of the human brain, it allows one to capture ideas much more faithfully than when writing them down on a piece of paper or into a book. Using this, better understanding can be obtained much, much faster. As a side effect, since you see your ideas playing right in front of you, better understanding of your own brain is built. And I would argue that the brain is the single most important tool of one's life. In summary, OrgPad is a tool for improving understanding of both problems and your brain itself. You can experiment with OrgPad at the address orgpad.com. If you find it helpful, it would be great if you can support our work. You can save 20% by using the promo code SOMEFREE. One more thing. I have mentioned in the beginning that I consider these mathematical jokes rather silly. As a bonus for watching this video till the end, let me show you two math jokes I find absolutely amazing. Do you know why Romans sucked in algebra? Because X was always 10. We are counting in the base 10 numbers. Mayans use the base 20 numeric system. Do you know why? Because they did not wear shoes. Thank you for watching this video. Gauss can be finally happy that his insight is no longer ignored or misunderstood. If you like this presentation or have any questions, please let me know in comments. I have ideas for many other interesting video topics, so your support can be a great motivator to make some more.